few years ago, American photographer Peter Menzel and writer Faith Daluizio have traveled the planet to document everything that an average family consume in a given week and how much it costs. Their project is entitled Hungry Planet and it was an exhibit all around the world. I actually saw, uh, saw it, I saw those pictures a few years ago when it was at the Museum of Science and Technology in Ottawa when it was still open and full of molds, I guess. So I hope you will have the opportunity to see that. I will try to put a link to those pictures uh, at the bottom of the sermon. And if you see those pictures, you will surely notice the significant difference. Um, the amount of food as well as its diversity is directly influenced by the origin of a family. And someone looking at this exhibit could easily come to conclusion that people living in North America has always more than enough to eat each week. It would be wonderful, but unfortunately, our country has also a problem of uneven redistribution of food and resources. We live in one of the wealthiest nations in the world, and yet numerous children are suffering from the absence of the basic necessity in lives. And here I'm not referring to an Xbox, HDTV, or iPads. There are too many that are going to school every morning on an empty stomach and with holes in their shoes. They live the equivalent of a Writer's Digest condensed version of a, a, a life. You, you remember the Writer's Digest um, condensed version of book. They were, let's say, a cheap abbreviation of bestsellers. Well, for those kids, that's their reality. It's a cheap abbreviation of life. And some would wonder, why do I talk about this today? Well, it's Thanksgiving weekend. And what began as a mix of a harvest festival and, and a religious expression of gratefulness for everything we have received uh, during the year, has become a true festival of abundance and also excess. According to what we see on TV or what we read in magazine, every family, every friends in the country gather around this huge and large table um, decorated with seasonal object and, and thematic colors and, and in the middle of it, oh, there's the biggest turkey you can imagine. And it's surrounded by potatoes, stuffing, cranberry sauce, apple salads, and pumpkin pies. And when everything is ready, we eat, we drink, uh, maybe watch a football or baseball game. And at the end of the day, all that we want is to sit down, unbuckle our belt, and rest from this orgy of indulgence. And, and yes, all of this feels good at the moment. However, unless we're completely oblivious of what's going on in the world, we cannot but sense a, a discomfort when we think about the poverty and the hardship that, that surround us. Of course we want to celebrate uh, people coming back home, uh, precious relationship, uh, or, or achievement, or, or say thank you for our beautiful jobs. But what about those who are currently walking in dark valleys, who are victims of systematic injustice, or if they don't know if there's going to be enough food at the end of the week? Should we refrain from feasting on Thanksgiving? And if we do, would it make a difference? What we should do? How we should behave? Well, in this letter to the Philippians, Paul gives us the beginning of an answer to those difficult questions when he claims, Rejoice in the Lord 
always. Again, I will say, rejoice. And those words, <coughs> I'm sorry, those words might be surprising for some because I don't know about you, but Paul does not have the reputation to suffer from Pollyanna. You know, the, this disposition that leads someone to think all good things will always happen and find always something good and everything. No. In his letter, uh, Paul sounds like more uh, a man who would pick an argument with everyone he meets and, and pointing the finger. And, and uh, these days it will be on Twitter, starting Twitter wars. And on top of, of this, from what we understand from the New Testament, Paul wrote his epistle to the Philippians from jail. I don't know about you once again. <coughs> I'm sorry, I don't know about you once again, but rejoice would not be the word that come to mind if I was in prison. And yet Paul states not once but twice, rejoice in the Lord. So to all of those women and especially men who made us feel that church was about keeping from doing from what makes us happy. To all of those religious leaders who taught us that joy, laughter, and pleasure were sin. To all of those who told us that we should be ashamed of being proud of the accomplishment of our loved one, Paul says, no, 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 no. God wants us to be happy. The Lord wants us to rejoice. And the joy Paul promotes is not the absence of pain, fear, and struggles, but the capacity to find satisfaction in everything and everyone. We're called to all of us to rejoice because Christ is not one of those remote judge looking over us, always judging us, watching us, but someone who is close at hand who dwell in our midst, who is near, near us. And Paul also says, do not worry about anything. Please, my friend, stop living in fear. Stop being anxious about everything. It seems that we live in a world of constant suspicion and distress. And the worst part of it is that we create it for ourselves. We have come to believe that at, at every corner there's something or someone that will attack us. The human race survived worse conditions for hundreds of millennia, but somehow we think that destruction and doom are imminent, that it will happen to us in a few seconds. I'll just give you an example, a very personal example. The other day I was late to drop my son to school, all my fault. I stopped the car, not in the uh, designated parking lot, but by the street in front of the school where it's perfectly legal to park. And I walked with my son to the main entrance and came back to my car and went to work to church. Well, in the afternoon, I received a message telling me that since school wants to ensure the safety of the children, I better not doing this again, because you see between the street and the main entrance, there's the lane <coughs> where the bus come to drop kids, and it could be dangerous. And I said to myself, I thought my son, what a school bus is, I taught him to look both sides before crossing the street and always to cross the street with an adult. I believe I did my job as a parent, but no, 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 how dare you lousy and irresponsible father to put your beloved son in such a dangerous situation. Ooh. Stop being afraid of everything. Well, you might say or think, <clears throat> what about those who have a good reason to worry? What about those who are anxious because they are regularly confronted with poverty, hunger, injustice, racism, discrimination, and all other troubles of life? Well, Paul tells us, not them, us, 
to let our gentleness to be known to everyone. Because we're all, all of us are in this, this life, all together. And we cannot turn a blind eye when our brothers and sisters are suffering. We cannot remain silent when oppression and darkness surrounds us. We cannot stay put when resources are unjustly distributed. We are called to be kind, considerate, mild, magnanimous, and generous. We should not be anxious about sharing our resources and abundance with those who have less. Sharing generosity does not diminish our assets. It's often the other way around. The more we give, the more we realize we have something to give. And there's grace to gain in giving, offering, and letting go of our fear of emptiness. And Paul also reminds us that in everything and every situation, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, to let our requests to be known to God. And I want to be clear here, no one should be grateful for being poor or ask for more hardship in their lives. No, no, no. It's just that since we feel Christ constantly near us, since we believe in a all-encompassing, loving God. Since we know that the Holy Spirit carries and inspires our thoughts and, and prayers, we should not be afraid to address the Holy One. In good times and also in bad times, we can look up to God and say, I'm offering this to you. These are my hopes my demands, my requests, all of this for me, for my loved ones, even for people I might not even know. And yet, and let, and let your will be done on earth as in heaven, because I'm not afraid, because I trust you, O oh God. On Thanksgiving weekend, as well as on other days of the year, we can rejoice. We can celebrate without anxiety because we know the Lord is with us. We can be generous and gentle to all of those who need our help without being afraid for our security. We can offer all that we have and also lack in prayer of thanksgiving and supplication. We can do all of this and way much more because regardless of our situation, regardless of our origins, we feel that we're never alone. We know that God is with us on this day of rejoicing and forevermore. Amen.